These true crime stories are ending with people in handcuffs, with guilty pleas and with guilty verdicts, thanks to this technique known as genetic genealogy. Serial offenders tend to either die or get caught. He's been called the Visalia Ransacker, the original Night Stalker, and the Golden State Killer. Authorities in four states agree that Bundy was personable. They also agree that he was a savage killer. Serial killers can compartmentalize their life. In other words, they can go out, brutalize, kill, go home, make breakfast for the children, take them to school, go to work. So their life is like in boxes. Today we're getting new and disturbing insights into the mental state of Brian Koberger, the PhD criminology student accused of murdering four University of Idaho students. Genetic genealogy. Genetic genealogy. Genetic genealogy. Genetic genealogy. Genetic genealogy. DNA has come a long way since its first use to solve a crime in 1986 in the UK. It has solved many of the world's most notorious crimes and apprehended some of the most notorious serial killers. In more recent years, forensic genealogy has become a more common way to catch criminals without having a DNA comparison. Genealogists are able to run DNA samples through public databases such as GEDmatch to find similar DNA. Then they use family trees to close in on their suspect. One of the most notable cases solved by forensic genealogy in the past few years was the Golden State Killer in 2018. Police used forensic genealogy to narrow down their suspect pool. When they found D'Angelo as a possible suspect, they followed him and collected DNA from his discarded trash. Then they were able to compare the DNA to evidence recovered from crime scenes. D'Angelo now serves 26 life sentences in a California prison. Since April 2018, 150 cases across the U.S. have been solved due to forensic genealogy. Police departments have been able to crack at least 28 cold cases using GEDmatch, genetic genealogy, and DNA testing since 2018. One of those cases being the 1989 murder of Fawn Cox in Kansas City. Tonight, a 31-year-old cold case is finally solved. The rape and murder of 16-year-old Fawn Cox has been the focus of several KCTV5 investigations. Her killer has finally been identified because of advanced DNA testing. Fawn Cox's murder was solved with the help of the FBI and with the use of genealogy, DNA testing. Donald Cox Jr., Fawn's cousin, was discovered as her killer. There's closure. The answers aren't always what we're, we were asking for, but there's closure. The 1972 murder of Jody Loomis in Washington was solved nearly 50 years later using evidence preserved. DNA was found at the crime scene on Jody's body and the heel of her boot. Following genetic genealogy identification, 78-year-old Terrence Miller was arrested for her murder. Soft-spoken and small in stature, the nearly 78-year-old Terrence Miller was a much younger man when investigators say he preyed upon 20-year-old Jody Loomis in August 1972. It was still daylight when detectives say the young woman was sexually assaulted and shot in the head in the woods in Mill Creek. Earlier that day, Jody had left her Bothell home to head to the stables, something she did routinely. But it was the first time she had ever ridden her bike there alone. This was such an innocent victim. She was just riding her bicycle down the road when she ended up being raped and murdered. And it's the oldest case that we have here in Snohomish County where we have DNA evidence. It's the kind of cold case investigators dream of solving. When Jody was killed, Miller would have been 30 years old. For detectives and Jody's loved ones, an arrest for her murder was a monumental moment. Miller lived 17 minutes away from where Jody was murdered. The 1974 murder of Carla Jan Walker was solved four and a half decades after the fact using forensic genealogy. 17-year-old Carla Walker sat in a Fort Worth parking lot with her boyfriend Rodney McCoy at the Brunswick Ridge Bowl. It was February 17, 1974, and her and Rodney had just been at the Valentine's Day dance at Western Hills High School. Carla and her boyfriend stopped by a local bowling alley quickly to use the bathroom. At some point, an unknown person jerked open the passenger side door of Rodney's car and using a gun threatened Rodney. At that point, Rodney was beat and pistol whipped until he fell unconscious. Rodney's last memory of Carla was at that point. He remembers Carla being grabbed and taken by a suspect that he described as a white male roughly 5 feet 10 inches. Rodney said the last thing he remembers hearing is Carla screaming for help. 
As soon as Rodney regained consciousness, Carla was nowhere to be seen. He immediately drove to Carla's house to inform her parents of the attack. Police were called and searched the area where Rodney had last seen Carla. Within three days, sadly, Carla would be found in a culvert in Lake Benbrook. She had been both beaten, strangled, and had also been sexually violated. Her autopsy would also produce a toxicology report that showed that she had been injected with morphine. Police were able to obtain samples of fluids from the crime scene. They were also able to preserve her clothing. For nearly half a century, her case would sit unresolved. One man, Glenn Samuel McCurley, was questioned less than two months after Carla's murder. A gun magazine had been found in the parking lot of the bowling alley where Carla was abducted. And police were able to tie it to McCurley. However, McCurley was released. He told investigators his gun had been stolen and there was nothing else tying him to the murder. Four and a half decades later, on September 10, 2020, investigators returned to McCurley's house where investigators took a swab of his DNA with his consent. Six days later, police were notified that the swabs matched the DNA found in Carla's bra. A warrant was issued for McCurley. McCurley was then arrested and charged with capital murder. One of America's most notorious serial killers, Ted Bundy, was convicted on evidence other than DNA, such as bike mark he had left on one of his victims. At the time of Bundy's trials, DNA didn't exist. Ted Bundy was a charmer. He charmed the shoes off of him. He was an enjoyable, likable, attractive person. He was um, thoughtful, charismatic. And overall, he was quite personable. I know that it's, it's a long time ago, it ceased to be an issue as to whether or not I was innocent or guilty. The issue is now is can we pin it on it? Can we, can we follow through and, and, and maintain our rep reputation as law enforcement officers? And I'll tell you, as long as they attempt to keep their heads in the sand about me, there's going to be people turning up in canyons and there's going to be people being shot in Salt Lake City because the police there aren't willing to accept what I think they know, and they know that I didn't do these things. In a bizarre confrontation between a sheriff with an eye toward re-election and his celebrity prisoner Ted Bundy, fresh off the FBI's 10 most wanted list. The television camera was there to record the start of the case of the state of Florida versus Theodore Robert Bundy. It would remain focused on him to the end. My chance to talk to the press. Contrary to section 78204 Florida statute. I'll plead not guilty right now. Newspaper copy described him as perhaps the most prolific killer of young women in the history of the nation. The critical moments in the courtroom began, of course, with jury selection, where I think we won hands down. We got a, a superb jury, all things considered. For more than three weeks, the Florida judicial system has struggled with the question of Bundy's guilt or innocence in the murders of two Florida State University sorority sisters. A crime so brutal, it made national headlines before it was ever discovered that Ted Bundy was involved. Now, last week, the jury said Bundy was guilty. Yesterday, the same jury said Bundy should die for the crime. Today, Judge Edward Coward agreed. This court has hereby imposed the death penalty upon Theodore Robert Bundy. It is further ordered that on such scheduled date that you be put to death by a current of electricity sufficient to cause your immediate death, and such current of electricity shall continue to pass through your body until you are dead. Hours before Bundy's execution in 1989, he confessed to killing many young women, including Deborah Kent, and told the police where her body was. In 2011, Ted Bundy's DNA was added to the national database to help solve cold cases. In 2015, human remains were found, leading investigators to review missing person files. As they researched, they came across news reports. In one of the reports, Deborah Kent's mother pulled out a box with a human bone that had been found where Bundy said he had left the teen's remains. In spring of 1989, officials had done a search in Fairview Canyon and found hundreds of bones. The only human bone was the bone that was then given to the Kent family. After learning the family still had the bone, the police ran DNA on the bone to confirm it was Deborah Kent. This then helped confirm Bundy's confessions of the killing of the missing Utah teen, Deborah Kent, and bring closure to her family. In the small university town of Moscow, Idaho, a massacre of four college students in the middle of the night so horrific, the coroner is still processing what she saw. They'll be looking under fingernails. They'll be doing all sorts of different exams. It was very, very traumatic. The four students and close friends found dead inside this home. An autopsy is pending, but police say an edged weapon like a knife was used in what they call a targeted attack. The friends seen together in this picture posted just hours before their murders. 
Ethan Chapin, a triplet from Washington, majoring in sport and tourism management in his freshman year, featured in a loving post written by another victim, Zana Kernodal, who wrote, Life is so much better with you in it. Love you. Zana was a junior majoring in marketing and worked as a server at a local restaurant with victim Madison Mogan, a senior in marketing. And Kaylee Gonzalez, a senior whose family said was the ultimate go-getter and adventurer tonight heartbroken by the news. Investigators releasing few details while the mayor telling the New York Times it may have been a crime of passion. Every little noise, I was like, is someone in the house? Like, I don't know. And it was, it was just scary. Like, it's all just shocking. Now a grieving college town waiting for answers about a murder scene too horrific to believe. More recently, Brian Kohlberger was connected to the Idaho 4 killings that took place November 13th, 2022. He was surveilled by law enforcement and connected to the crime using forensic genealogy. Police then collected his DNA and discarded trash and got a match with the evidence from the crime scene. An arrest warrant was issued and he was charged with the four murders. Police made note in the arrest affidavit that both forensic genealogy as well as digital footprints led to the arrest. He is yet to have a trial and his preliminary hearing is set for June 26, 2023. Though by law everyone is innocent until proven guilty, it is nearly impossible to defend DNA evidence. The legality of the investigative and forensic genealogy is still relatively new and has yet to face serious legal challenges. It is perceived by law enforcement circles as a vital tool to solving even current crimes, but regulations and legislation have not caught up. Forensic genealogy has an ability to solve cases from decades ago and give closure to families who have gone without it for so long.